My name is Philip Donnelly. I teach in the Great Text program here at Baylor University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this plenary session and to introduce you to our distinguished speaker. Dr. Angel Adams Parham is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Virginia, where she is also a senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. Her main scholarly work is in historical sociology. Uh, but in what might seem like a departure from both the merely positivist and the merely ideological traditions of sociological research, she actually takes her study of the past as an invitation to participate in a conversation about the most important matters regarding how to live well in the present and how to envision the future with wisdom and discernment. Her uh, book, uh, her distinguished monograph, uh, is titled American Roots, Racial Palimpsest, and the Transformations of Race, published by Oxford in 2017, which won awards from both the Social Science History Association and the American Sociological Association. Now, Dr. Parham also understands the vocation of a scholar to include, in fact, the work of public wisdom seeking, you might call it or philosophia. In particular, she's worked to provide resources and training for K through 12 educators who are looking to better integrate black writers and black history into their teaching. And this work led her to become the co-founder and executive director for Nyanza Classical Community, an educational organization which provides curricula and programming designed to connect with students from diverse backgrounds, inviting them to take part in the great conversation to cultivate the moral imagination, and to pursue truth, goodness, and beauty. Now, some of the fruits of that work also appeared in her 2022 book, which is titled The Black Intellectual Tradition, which she co-authored with uh, Anika Prather, and subtitled Reading Freedom in Classical Literature. Now, the talk that Dr. Parham will be giving today is part of an exciting new project that she's been working on. I visited her with, uh, about this a little bit, and just delighted to, to hear what she has to say. The title of her presentation is Reckoning and Reconciliation, Race, Memory, and Moral Imagination in American Life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Parham. Absolutely beautiful introduction. I'm very grateful to you. Um, and it's great to see Todd. Thank you. Um, we, the three of us together, did a, a wonderful NEH meeting this summer, and it's just such a pleasure to be back here at Baylor with you all. So, yes, as promised, I'm going to be speaking with you um, on a new research project. Well, it's been a few years, but it's my current book project on reckoning and reconciliation, race, place, and moral imagination in American life. So, race, place, and moral imagination. Uh, I begin here with a quotation from Toni Morrison. And this is taken from her novel, Beloved. Um, toward the end of that novel, she writes, it was not a story to pass on. Remembering seemed unwise. And for those of you who've read Beloved, you'll know exactly what that's referring to. And for those of you who haven't, this is an invitation to read Beloved. Right? Um, and so what I can tell you is it has to do with aspects of our past coming back to us, sometimes in very unexpected ways, especially aspects of a, a fairly traumatic past. So the images that you're seeing right here um, are images from the past in New Orleans. I lived in New Orleans for 18 years, and so much of my work still centers on New Orleans. But the central lessons that I'm bringing today, I think, are applicable in many places across the United States and across the world, which has to do with how we wrestle with the difficult past. Um, so the image that you see on the left is a drawing from the old St. Louis Hotel in the 19th century. And it was a grand luxury hotel. And there were daily slave auctions that were held under this rotunda that you see here. And so people would go there, they would stay, they would go to their balls and so on. And they would also go to the auction and watch people being sold. What you see on the right um, is a picture in the 20th century after it's fallen into disrepair, right? 
And we're going to come back to this particular site, um, but I just wanted to make sure you knew what that was. These are images um, also of the St. Louis Hotel and then now the hotel that sits on that same site. So on the left is the St. Louis Hotel in the 19th century, and on the right is its 21st century incarnation as the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel in the French Quarter today. All right, and so this is one of three sites that I'm going to be looking at and um, kind of just asking some deep questions about it. You'll see from the subtitle that I'm going to be talking about the imagination and particularly the moral imagination, right? But I wanted to start out with um, other kinds of imagination. And Frederick Douglass puts this very well when he talks about racism as being the result of a diseased imagination, that is. Um, right? So there are many different ways that we imagine, um, and racism is the fruit of a diseased imagination that he urges us um, to decultivate. In terms of place, um, just as a lead into why I decided to do this work and on places, because there are three places in New Orleans that I look at over 300 years, trying to understand and use those places as lenses for helping us to understand aspects of some of the most difficult and complicated aspects of our past. So why places? Um, so this quote from Wisdom Sits in Places is looking at the way um, the Apache have traditionally understood place and history and ethical formation. And it brings for us, I think, some alternative lenses for thinking about place. And so I'm going to go through this whole quote because I think it's so important to really think about place in a way that is perhaps not really um, something that we're used to. So Vassar writes, this is what we know about our stories. They go to work on your mind and make you think about your life. Maybe you've not been acting right. Maybe you've been stingy. People don't like it, so someone goes hunting for you. Anyone can do it. Many things jump up at you and block your way. But you won't forget that story. You're going to see the place where it happened, maybe every day if it's nearby. If you don't see it, you're going to hear its name and see it in your mind. It doesn't matter if you get old, that place will keep on stalking you like the one who shot you with the story. Maybe that person will die. Even so, that place will keep on stalking you. It's like that person is still alive. So what you see here, um, what is behind this discussion of place and story, is that they have a way of talking about place taking you to specific places in the community's history and relating the history of that place and some of the ethical lessons of that place. Um, and so it's a way of continually, whenever you are walking near that place or by it, it brings to mind specific aspects of the community's history and helps you to understand where you fit into that history and helps you to actively draw lessons from the past. In other words, it's not like places are just built over and covered over and you just move on and you don't think about it. But the places in the landscape remain potent for providing lessons in ethical formation. And so this is part of where I am coming from and thinking very deeply about places and some of the lessons that they have for us. Also drawing from um, Willie James Jennings' book, The Christian Imagination, he also is very attentive to the history of places um, and very significantly thinking about how does place work together with some of the troubled histories that we have around race and justice. And so he says, our lives, even if one day freed from racial calculations, suffer right now from a less helpful freedom, freedom from the ground the dirt, landscapes, and animals from the collaborative with rhythms of God's other creatures and from the possibilities of imagining adjoining to other peoples exactly in and through joining their lives on the ground. In effect, a post-racial future, if imagined inside the current order of things, will be only a continuing reflex of the commodification and transformation of space. And so this is also where I'm coming from, is if we don't learn some of these lessons from particular places, then we are likely to replicate some of the very oppressive logics that we've used to develop those places or underdevelop those places over time. So toward this end, what I've been developing for this new book is a, it's a conceptual framework um, and it's an analytical tool called the Luda Souvenir. And so a Luda Souvenir is a very tightly demarcated place. It could be a house, 
a larger building, it could even be an empty plot of land that you're going to look very deeply into over its history over hundreds of years. And what I have really enjoyed about it is it gives you a very disciplined way of excavating the past because you're looking at this plot of land and looking at transformations in that plot of land over time. Um, and inevitably, it gives you access to many um, kind of rich aspects of our very complex history. So it's very important, I think, to kind of distinguish what I'm talking about with Le de Souvenir from two other concepts that are very similar that you might come across if you do this kind of work. Um, the first is the Le de Memoir, a French historian named Pierre Nora um, developed this concept. And so the Le de Souvenir is in conversation with Nora's work, um, but it's slightly different, and I'll get into that in a moment. Another is the idea of sites of conscience. So the Le de, Mem the Le de Memoir by Pierre Nora um, this is the idea that there are certain kinds of places, monuments, um, even pieces of literature, it could be a de memoir that calls people together, often when their sense of community and identity is fading. And they're trying and they're grasping to kind of get a sense of who are we, um, and trying to pull that together in places or in kinds of literature or in archives. The site of conscience is more a kind of, it's a, a popular, um, it's a group of places across the world that have had traumatic histories. And the sites of conscience is a, a kind of movement, if you will, for people to think very carefully about places of trauma and their healing. So the distinction that I draw between the Lude Memoir is that the Lude Memoir is often a place where people are strengthening their sense of who they are and they're often dominant sites of remembering, so sites of remembering dominant histories, which has been one of the critique of the way that Le de Memoir are used is that it's often kind of the surface dominant understanding of the place, whereas a Le de Souvenir is often digging beneath that and asking some really probing questions about what is it that we have in common together and what are some of the buried aspects of our history that perhaps are not coming to the surface. And then for sites of conscience, some Le de Souvenir are also sites of conscience, but not necessarily. Um, so it's quite possible to have a Le de Souvenir that does not have a traumatic history, um, but you're just trying to look deeply into that place to understand some aspect of continuity and change and culture formation over time. Um, so, so that's kind of the analytic distinction between the Le de Souvenir that I've been developing in this work and the Le de Memoir and the sites of conscience. So you might be thinking, okay, so you start out looking at this hotel, you know, that has this, this really intense past. And I'm sure you can imagine other places, you know, um, maybe monuments that have been controversial, controversial, and you could see where something like a Luda Souvenir might be useful, but is this really something that matters in my everyday life? And so I wanted to impart to you a couple of ways that this has really been living and active in my life, in unexpected ways. I wasn't looking for it. So the first happened 20 years ago in 2003. I had just moved to New Orleans for my first job and it was my first wedding anniversary. And so my husband and I booked a bed and breakfast in St. Francisville, Louisiana. We go to the bed and breakfast. It's an absolutely lovely place. It's organized as a series of cottages. And then in the morning we went up to the house, the, the main house to have our breakfast. And we were being served by an older um, black woman. So we're having this wonderful breakfast and enjoying it. And it was just the two of us and the woman who had cooked for us. And so we get into a conversation and I'm asking her something about herself. And it comes out that um, this is a former plantation and she is descended from the people who were on that plantation as enslaved persons. You can just imagine how shocking that was to me to find out that I've come to my first wedding anniversary to stay on a former plantation and be served by the descendants of the former slaves of that plantation. Needless to say, none of this was in the um, promotional literature. Um, you know, so th this was very much um, a surprise for me. So this is the first time I encounter something like this, and this is where the past kind of comes back and jumps up at you in these very unexpected ways. Um, as it turned out, um, this woman had raised several children who were doing very well, who were all college educated, so I was very happy to learn that at the very least. Um, another, about 20 years later, um, was at St. Augustine. My family and I had gone for a couple of vacations there and stayed in the same community. 
The second time we stayed in the same community, I said, you know, shame on me, I haven't done any looking into the history of this community, and I should know from doing historical work that this is an important thing to do. So I started Googling, and I find out that um, we had been staying in a place called Lincolnville. This time it was an Airbnb, so you can track the history from the bed and breakfast to the Airbnb. It's an Airbnb in Lincolnville, and it turns out that this was a very vibrant black community post-emancipation. Um, and Lincolnville had been undergoing progressive um, and fairly aggressive gentrification um, and transformation where the black community was slowly being drained out of it and the whole area was being very much Airbnb'd. And so I was um, inadvertently participating in this whole process where this historic black community was being emptied out and the space was being very much re-commodified from being um, single owner and rental housing to now being Airbnbs, which makes it very difficult um, for everyday people to live there. So these are examples just from everyday living where once you start to learn about what's the history of this place, you know, what were some of the past um, struggles that led up to where it is now? I'm gonna skip over UVA and go right to Newport. You can find me later if you wanna know more about the UVA um, example I have here. But I just recently read something um, in the Chronicle of Higher Education about Christopher Newport University, but it could be almost any university. Many universities have um, a kind of troubled history with the communities surrounding them. And this one, um, they had a, a visual graphic that was really very, very striking, which I will share with you now. So as you look at this, what I want you to do is I want you to keep your eye on the differences between the blue areas and the orange areas. Um, so the blue area is the black middle class community that existed there before the university is built. And then the orange area will be the university as it is establishing itself. So that gives you in a very, very quick visual what happened with this community. And as I said, I'm not trying to pick on Christopher Newport University. Many universities have a similar kind of relationship to the surrounding areas that they're in. And this is an ongoing issue, right? So what should we do about this, right? Um, there are very different perspectives on how we should relate to the past. And so I'd like to start with post-emancipation in the 1880s and the 1890s there were very different perspectives within the black community about how we should relate to the past, right? Just come out of hundreds of years of enslavement, violent oppression, um, what should we do with this past, which is very, very recent in this case, in 1885. Uh, so Alexander Crummel was a leading intellectual at the time, and he said, you know, we need to move on. We need to move on from slavery. This is not something that we should be thinking about too much. So he says, what I would fain have you guard against is not the memory of slavery, but the constant recollection of it, as the commanding thought of a new people, who should be marching on to the broadest freedom of thought in a new and glorious present and a still more magnificent future. So he says, of course you'll remember something about it, but you don't want to dwell on it, right? This is going to hold you back if you're thinking about it too much. Frederick Douglass was at this talk, and he disagreed very much with Alexander Crummel. So he says, it is not well to forget the past. Memory was given to man for some wise purpose. The past is the mirror in which we may discern the dim outlines of the future and by which we may make them more symmetrical. There have also been um, debates about this in terms of thinking about the nation state and how nation states were formed and what do we do with some of the violence that's in the past of the formation of many nation states, not just the United States. So Ernest Renan, in his essay, What is a Nation, says, maybe we should really just forget. And he says, I would go so far as to say, we should engage in historical error. Because otherwise, you know, all of these nations have these violent pasts. How are we ever going to make a life together if we are constantly remembering? Um, it might actually be better to just teach erroneous history than to remember what actually happened. Theodore Adorno, writing in the shadow of the Holocaust, um, has a different perspective 
He says one wants to break free of the past, rightly because nothing at all can live in its shadow, and because there will be no end to the terror as long as guilt and violence are repaid with guilt and violence. But wrongly, because the past that one would like to evade is still very much alive. The past will have been worked through only when the causes of what happened then have been eliminated. Only because the causes continue to exist does the captivating spell of the past remain to this day unbroken. So what I find interesting about what Adorno says here is that in a sense he actually agrees with Renan. He says, yeah, you know, there's a real risk here in remembering. You don't want a situation where you just have ongoing recriminations and bitterness between people. So he's acknowledging there is a risk there, you know, it's, and you can see why you want to forget the past. Um, and in fact, many of us do want to forget what has been very difficult or violent about the past. But then he says, but actually, the past will keep coming back until you have dealt with it in one way or another. And this relates very directly, again, back to Toni Morrison's Beloved and her concept of remembering. Um, so if you've read the novel, or for those of you who will now read it, um, that concept of remembering is very similar to what Adorno is talking about here. She's doing it in a literary way, and, and he is doing it more in a kind of political, um, social thought approach. But there is something about especially traumatic pasts that try as you might to paper them over or bury them. They tend to come back at you, often when you least expect it and in ways that are very, very concerning and sometimes violent. And so what Adorno is saying, we all want to forget it. We all want to put it behind us. But we have to do the work of working through that past. So as I get into some of this work on memory, um, I see that the way that we relate to memory um, provides a very potent opportunity for moral formation. Similar to um, Wisdom Sits in Places, that quote that I read to you from the Apache and their approach to history. Um, so the idea of post-memory, what Hirsch says, is that it's retrospective witnessing by adoption. And it provides an ethical relation to the oppressed or persecuted other. We have prosthetic memory, and what Landsberg has in mind is um, different experiential places or films or so on that help with our ethical thinking about the past. And she traces this and says that this has some similarities to the ethical dimension of medieval book memorizing. Now, how might that be? How, how do we get to the medieval period? So she is actually here drawing very directly on the work of Mary Carruthers, who has some absolutely outstanding work. Um, her book, the book of memory is all on medieval memory practices. And here's what she says, and this really gets at the heart of memory as moral formation. Memoria in the medieval period was an integral part of the virtue of prudence, that which makes moral judgment possible. Training the memory was much more than a matter of providing oneself with the means to compose and converse intelligently when books were not readily to hand. For it was in trained memory that one built character, judgment, citizenship, and piety. And so that is what I am wanting to build on with this book, Reckoning and Reconciliation. I'm looking at how it helps us at this intersection of history, memory, and ethics. And in order to do that, I'm using this Luda Souvenir analysis of deep um, historical excavation of three different places. And I'm also bringing in um, this, this proposal that we use that Luda Souvenir analysis to dwell at this intersection between the sociological and the moral imaginations. And what I think that will help us do is to avoid some of what these authors found when they did um, a, a kind of travel across the countryside looking at plantations. And what was the history and the interpretation of these plantations? And they found um, that for most of them, it was symbolic annihilation and erasure of slavery. And, or if they did mention slavery, it was trivializ trivialization and deflection. And you might think, if you haven't been on a plantation tour, you might think, well, naturally, if it's a plantation, something about slavery is going to come up. Um, but until relatively recently, it was actually rare that there would be any mention of the enslaved people. Or if there was, it would be this trivialization and deflection that it was not something that was dwelt on over much. 
And so what I think Luda Souvenir can help us to do is to counter that erasure and that trivialization and help us to look forward. Um, and so Luda Souvenir and that kind of analysis invites us to ask these questions. Who have we been? Who are we now? And who do we desire to be in the future? And this is where I, I really want to emphasize that this is not a project that is meant to help people to dwell more in bitterness and anger. That is not the idea. It is really much more forward-looking and hopeful about who are we as a community? Who do we want to be? Yes, there have been some horrible things in the past, and we don't want to replicate those. So it's helpful to know what that past is, why it was allowed to go on the way it was, and to think now about who we want to be moving forward. So since most of you are not sociologists, I'm just going to review very basically what is the sociological imagination. Um, so the sociological imagination in C. Wright Mills' work, it helps us to distinguish between personal troubles and public issues of social structure. So what does that mean? Um, so let's take somebody who is unemployed and they think it's all, you know, just them. Like, they have been unlucky or they, you know, there's been kind of injustice toward them. And so they interpret that as a personal trouble. Um, whereas what might be going on is a public issue of social structure. You know, maybe um, there is a, a, an economic problem in the society at large. Maybe there is a recession going on. You know, there's something else that is at issue and it's a social structural issue that's impacting individuals. And so the sociological imagination helps us to think structurally. Um, and so bringing that to bear in our understanding of the past, what have been some of the social structures of the past and some of them in the present that continue to generate ongoing inequalities. But very key here is that the facts that we learn from the sociological imagination have to be interpreted. Facts never stand on their own, right? And so this is where the moral imagination comes in. And I'm drawing here on the work of philosopher John Keeks, although there are, there are many other authors I've looked at for the moral imagination. But he has a definition that I find particularly useful. The moral imagination is our capacity for making pictures or images of the good life and then coming to resemble those pictures through a process of self-evaluation that enlarges our understanding about the possibilities open to us. And so these are the kinds of questions that are spurred by this moral imagination. What story am I a part of? And in this case, I'm talking about the American project. What is the American project? What kind of story is it? Is it a tragedy? Is it one of redemption? Is it triumphalist? Are there heroes and villains of this story? Or do we think in terms of turning enemies into friends, which is one of the ways that Martin Luther King Jr. Um, approached his work in the civil rights movement. Um, it's not just enemies and, and heroes, but it's if there are people who are presently enemies, how do we turn those people into friends? That was a very significant part of his work for racial justice. And then also, what role do I have in contributing to this story? Right? So the moral imagination brings us to these kinds of questions and is often um, most fashioned by literature. And you know, kind of combining this, again, is why I like to start off with Toni Morrison, because there's a lot you can learn in literature that can sometimes be harder to learn in social science accounts. And so I think they work very well together. So I can identify at least three kinds of moral evaluative lenses um, that we tend to use, especially when we're thinking about American history. And each of those is accompanied by a particular socio-political posture, that is, you know, how should we think about and act toward that history. Um, so there's the idea that there are nefarious roots um, of American history that keep sending out these tendrils in the present, right? You think about um, Native American genocide and slavery and so on, right? That the whole project is nefarious at the root, and you have to basically uproot it, and so you want to critically reject it and recreate the whole thing. Okay, so that would be one possible way. Um, another moral evaluative lens is that it's fallen, but it's redeemable. Um, so certainly, there are aspects that have been horrifying, but it's something that's re redeemable. So you're going to engage in critique, but we are going to work together to co-create something that is better moving forward. A third approach is to say there might have been a couple of bumps along the road, but basically we're resilient and we've been triumphant, and it's, it's really the idea of American greatness that doesn't really let much um, in for the idea of any kind of critique. 
It's really like there might have been a couple things in the past, but really the whole thing is pretty much good on the whole, and we shouldn't look at or dwell on any of those in the past. So they're kind of on the spectrum, right? So what I want to do now is I want to give you an introduction to the three cases that I'm looking at over 300 years. And what you will see here is um, one of several different kinds of um, interactive pieces of media that I'm developing together with the book. And the reason that I'm doing that is because the visual component, I think, is so important to this project. Um, there's only so much, I think, that you get out of reading the text on the page. Um, I think having this accompanying visual component, and you can tell me afterward if it's useful or not, but I think it's part of telling the story. Uh, so this is an introduction to the three cases. Three places. I'll be focusing today on the hotel. But what I found as I've been looking at this is that there are two different, at least two different kinds of the souvenir, the occluded and the emerging. And the occluded are the ones where there's not much of a conversation going on about the past. And the emerging are those where there is a conversation that is going on and where there's an attempt to wrestle with that past. So the three sites, the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel is the most occluded um, for obvious reasons. It's a luxury hotel. It's not the kind of thing. It's like my um, bed and breakfast in St. Francisville. You're not going to put that in the promotional materials. Um, the Treme neighborhood is where the New Orleans African American Museum is, and that is one that is resisting occlusion because the process of gentrification is very much threatening the cultural history there and pushing out those who historically have created so much of the second lines and the music that New Orleans is famous for comes directly out of that neighborhood. But people are having a hard time living there anymore. Uh, and the Herman Grima House is the third site that's in the French Quarter. And this is emerging in a very interesting way. So I've been able to serve on the board of this um, Herman Grima House. It's a historic home where people do tours. So I've been on the board the last three years, and it's during that time that they've actually transformed the tour. It used to focus on the wealthy white families, and now it focuses on the enslaved people, and it's an urban enslavement tour. And there was still some, some discussion and some contention um, within the board of, is the, should it stay this way? Should we have more than one tour? How do we do this? How do we interpret this past? So just a, um, a peek into some of the methods for this. Um, so it's archival work, standard archival work that I do in the archives in New Orleans and in France. It's also visual architectural, so I've brought in architectural history into what I'm doing and then interviews for looking at the most recent layer of each place and its history. So in relation to this, the next thing that I'm gonna show you is a, a, shorter, a shorter recreation of what's called Maspero's Exchange. And so before you had the old St. Louis Hotel and before you had today's luxury hotel, there was a smaller place called Maspero's Exchange on the same land in the same block. And it was the, um, the predecessor of the St. Louis Hotel, which had that big rotunda with the slave auctions. And so to my joy, as I was doing archival work, I found this 1822 document that was a probate record for Pierre Maspero, who used the space and who developed it and had a tavern and a boarding house and a place of entertainment on this land. And what it did is it walks you through, the person walked through every single room, described the dimensions, described what street it fronted on, and it explained every single object in every single room. And on the team of people who are doing the digital work, um, Two of them are trained as architects and one is in architectural history. I said, I would like you to read through this document and draw a floor plan based on the description. And then the person who does the digital rendering created a reconstruction of what the place might have looked like. Um, and then based on what was in the inventory, we've begun to actually furnish the different rooms in um, communication with an expert in 19th century material culture of New Orleans. And so what you will see is the best rendering that we have based on the documents. So that is circa 1822. Uh, after his death, it goes into new hands and it continues on as an exchange. And here you've got a newspaper ad advertisement, which is advertising marketing that's going on at this exchange. So there are a number of different sites throughout New Orleans where different kinds of sales would happen, including sales of enslaved people. And so this 1828 advertisement 
is advertising um, the, the sale of 34 slaves at the exchange, same place that you just saw. Then in 1838, this glamorous St. Louis Hotel is built. All right, and this is one of the only drawings we have of the floor plan, which we're using also in our digital rendering. It had public baths, it had a bank, it had you know, beautiful shops, ballrooms, and so on and so forth. And then it also had the, you can see just at the top, the outline of the rotunda, which is where the slave auctions would happen every day at noon. And here you have an example of one of the women who was sold here with her children. Um, so this is Susan, aged about 35 years, good cook, washer, and ironer, and her two young children, Thomas and Susan, about nine years old and six years old. They also had a newsroom in a time when you didn't have libraries and it was very hard to get media. This was a very big deal. So this you could subscribe and come and read in the newsroom and get the latest periodicals, books, and so on. And so it was another um, site of recreation. After the Civil War, it began to decline. Um, this was an attempt to try to revive it um, after the Civil War that did not work. And then we move into the late 19th, early 20th century, where you start to get a very curious way of remembering the St. Louis Hotel. And this is where things start to get very interesting in terms of what do we remember and what do we not? You remember that the quote that we started out with, remembering seemed unwise. Um, it was not a story to pass on. This is where you start to get the story passed on in a very different way than one might expect, um, certainly from the perspective of the enslaved people. There was a series of postcards that was made uh, about the old St. Louis Hotel in the early 20th century, and they were very, very popular. Uh, this is one from the archives that was written to a young woman named Caroline. And up close, it gives you a little bit of the background of the old St. Louis Hotel and the rotunda. And then on the back of it, this is what Uncle Jack writes. Dear Caroline, Aunt Sandy will tell you a story about this quaint old place where Negroes were were to be sold as slaves, lovingly Uncle Jack, 1907. So that gives you a sense of kind of how the place is being remembered. It's being remembered as a place of nostalgia, as kind of the good old days, the glamorous old days. This is another postcard, and it is supposedly a woman who was sold on this block when she was a young girl. This is the hotel today, right? So this is in the same, it's been rebuilt, it was demolished and rebuilt, and this is the hotel today on the same block, the same footprint as Maspero's Exchange in the 1822, the old St. Louis Hotel in the 1830s and 1840s, and then today, now. And so the question is, to what extent are we able to work through the past in this kind of site? This is all in the lobby as you walk in, and then at the back of the lobby, is a nice painting that shows the old St. Louis Hotel and gives you a description of it. And so it describes how glamorous the hotel was, who the architect was, the painter of the, it talks about the rotunda. Um, it does not say anything about the slave auctions that happened under the rotunda. Um, it just talks about the paintings on the rotunda. Interestingly, at the very back of the hotel on St. Louis, on, um, on Charter Street in the French Quarter, when they decided to reconstruct the hotel to make today's Omni Royal Orleans, the architect decided to keep some of the masonry from the old St. Louis Hotel. And you can just make out at the top there part of the change from exchange when it was the old city exchange before it became the St. Louis and so on and so forth. Um, and so it's this kind of ghostly reminder of what used to be there. Uh, a group of activists has managed to put a plaque on the back of the hotel that does talk about the slave auctions that happened, but it is by the loading dock in the back where no one really ever goes to see it. So I'm gonna wrap up by talking about, you know, what do we do with these Luda souvenir? So for the occluded Luda souvenir like the hotel, there's a clear conflict between the past and the present identities and constituencies, um, potential for protest, which is part of the reason that you're not going to get a very forthcoming conversation. Um, but this also means that we have a truncated vocabulary and truncated practices for wrestling with these difficult issues. It just don't talk about it. Right? And so we don't develop any practice or models for how to talk about it or think about it. And then there's also the question, even for those that are emerging um, from this, the, the past being repressed, 
which is do we take an opt-in or transformative approach to places like the Herman Grima House? So this is the one that switched from being about the wealthy white families to the other kind of a 180, the urban enslavement tour. And so there's ongoing debate now. Should we have two tours that are going at the same time so that people can opt into an enslavement tour or opt out of it and not have to hear about it at all? Um, and so that is something that we are still grappling with and many other historic sites are grappling with similar kinds of questions. And then finally, um, better engaging the local public because what's significant, if you think back to that quote that I read from um, Wisdom Sits in Places from the, the Apache tradition, what was so significant about that is that this was a local community where local people from that community were being ethically formed in their own history. However, many of these sites and many historic sites across the country are often visited by people from out of town and when you look at the numbers of local visitors, it's pretty low. Um, the Herman Grima House, the numbers, whenever I ask for those numbers, when we have different meetings, it's usually on the order of about 10 to 12 percent of the visitors are local. Most, the vast majority of the visitors are not from there. And so that means that the local people are not grappling with this history. It's a very different thing when visitors from out of town come in and say, oh wow, you know, that's, that's a lot that you all have to deal with here, but it's very different when local people are able to come and engage and learn about and wrestle with these histories. So better engaging the local public is very important. And so what's at stake if we fail to address the malformed imagination? I think what happens is that we continue to duplicate and to replicate some of the most hurtful aspects of our past, right? Um, so it's not like I want to have protests up and down the street at this hotel and say, you know, we should shut this horrible place down. That is not what I'm aiming for whatsoever, right? The hotel is there, it's done. But as we move forward, how do we make decisions in this area, in other areas that have a troubled past. Think about what we saw with the expansion of Christopher Newport University. We could just as well do this with the University of Virginia. We are still making active decisions now about how and where to build, about how to interpret the past. Um, even without saying that we should change what had already happened. We can't change what happened, but we can learn from it and engage that knowledge for the future. Otherwise, we're most likely to just replicate similar kinds of logics. And then finally, what role is there for Christians to address a malformed moral imagination in particular? And so I think there is a potential in this kind of Ludus Souvenir analysis. So churches thinking about the, the lands that they inhabit and you know, what is the history of that land? How do we relate to that? Um, Christian colleges and universities in particular, again, you know, universities often have these kinds of troubled histories with the um, communities that surround them. And then also listening to the deep histories of the places that we dwell in order to be a source of healing. And that would be for all Christians, wherever you dwell, your individual house, your community, what are some of the, the deep histories? How do we attend to and listen to those sensitively in order to live and envision well for the future? And I will leave it there and I thank you very much.
sin to the way that Christ asks us to forgive. Wonderful. I think it's a really great question. Um, so part of my, the larger framework that I've used for thinking about this in the book that came out last year when I was looking at the black intellectual tradition and traumatic past um, was first just drawing on um, some of the work on, on lament um, and Sung Cheng Ra's book, Prophetic Lament, that I think is particularly helpful. Um, and part of what he talks about there is that especially for um, wealthy Western Christians, that we tend to not really dig deeply into that, the practices of lament, where it's not where you're trying to heap guilt on someone, right? Um, when I think about some of the very contentious conversations we've been having here in the United States, it can seem that there is this, um, this sense of heaping guilt on people, you know, we're gonna, you, know, you should, examine all aspects of the privilege you've had and feel horrible about it and you know I don't find that particularly helpful but what I do find helpful especially for believers is to kind of recapture some of this sense of lament going back into the scriptures which is a mourning with people right um, and so you're not forgetting or repressing but you are mourning with and you are realizing and you're acknowledging some of the sins of the past um, but in terms of forgiveness, you're not necessarily holding on to bitterness about that. That would divide you. And this is part of also what I talk about in that book and why I think it's such a gift to look at the black intellectual tradition and the black church, where you see a group of people who have been through excruciating injustice, who are believers, and who are not going to say, oh, none of that mattered. Um, of course it matters. Um, but they're also not holding on to bitterness in a way that tears themselves apart or tears the whole society apart. Um, there's a, a need to recognize what has been unjust, to recognize communal sin, to lament that sin, um, and then also to say, okay, how does that form us differently moving forward? There, there should be something reflective in who we are as believers that then affects the way that we walk in the world when we are realizing that and when we are trying to grapple with the past. question and I think it's 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 perhaps a bit complicated because some of it has to do with some of the reason I think it could turn into something that is unhealthy is when trying to talk about that past is repeatedly ignored um, by the dominant culture or repressed by the dominant culture and that can make people get more and more upset and angry right so I think there is something of an interaction here that's important um, is that in order to make room for this so that it doesn't fester, it's very important that all of us are able to engage in a healthy kind of remembering. Um, otherwise, what you tend to get is, is repression and anger that builds up over time. So I don't, I don't think it's only the person who is remembering, but I also think it's the larger community that they're trying to interact with and be in conversation with being open to that. I think both are at issue. Hi. Great to see you again. Is it? Is it on? So. 
Excellent, excellent. I am so glad you were able to read that. Uh, so um, she's referencing Saidia Hartman's Lose Your Mother. Um, and so I, I would also recommend that too. And Saidia Hartman did a similar kind of journey going back to West Africa and visiting. And you know, she had some initial ideas about how she might be received and what it would be like that were, um, it was pretty difficult for her when she got there and she saw how she was received as an African American. Um, but yeah, it sounds like the numbers are very similar there to what they are in many of our historic sites where you're getting so many people flying across the world to see it and fewer local people. Um, this is, you know, when we deal with this at the Herman Grima House, it's, we're continually trying to think how do we tap into schools more, tap into teachers, provide curricula. Um, how do we make this something that is user friendly, that draws people in? Because ideally, if you could draw in the school system um, and have some kind of interchange and field trips that would be very helpful. I'm sure there must be some kind of local engagement there, but you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are there. But I think it's really up to the local um, caretakers of culture um, and historical sites there in Ghana to really actively do that. Um, and I don't, I'm not privy to the kinds of conversations they're having or not having. But I would say from what I'm seeing in the United States, it is so difficult and it takes so much work. You'd have to be very, very dedicated to doing it. But I do think that once you build those bridges and create um, the, the channels to get local people to come in and sometimes have incentives for them, that there is, I think it's possible for that to happen, but it's not going to just happen. People are going to have to devote resources and time to it. And it may be that in that case, um, they're really looking, I mean, and this is kind of the subtext of so many of these sites, is that economically, they have to sustain themselves. They're still working in a larger market. And so it's a question of who's going to pay to come and see the site so that we can sustain this place. And there's that tension across historic sites also in the United States. I've spoken with um, uh, the, the, the main um, development person um, and PR person at a, a, a former plantation in Louisiana who he has experience um, working with colleagues abroad. Um, so we were both on a trip to France and it was very different there because they had a lot of state funding for what they were doing. And so because they had a lot of state funding, they were able to get some of these more controversial issues um, developed and provide funding for them. And he looks across the ocean longingly um, because in his context and in, in most of the context here, you have very little state funding to, to kind of grapple with this. And so what that means is that you're at the mercy of the market. Um, and there are only so many people who want to come see an urban enslavement tour, right? And I'm thinking similarly in Ghana, when you think about the economic differentials between Americans and the disposable income that we have to spend versus locals there, they may feel that, well, this is where our market is, right? And so this is where we're gonna kind of pour the resources in because that's the money that we need to sustain the place. Whereas maybe they're not seeing that kind of market potential for local people. And so I think those are some of the underlying dynamics at issue. Um, I'd like to first of all thank you for your presentation. It was extremely informative and I'm very excited for um, what you have presented and what we are going to receive soon, hopefully down the line. I'd like to know as you were considering this work and as you started to um, uh, move toward the realization, actualization of it, what issues, what challenges, what roadblocks did you encounter and how did you deal with them? Good. So um, I think the, the major roadblocks have to do, well, I don't know if it's really a roadblock. I think I didn't realize how massive a project it was um, <laughs> at the beginning, right? Um, and so, you know, in order to do this kind of very deep dive, you are going to have to look into architectural history, um, archeological reports, you know, things that sociologists are not necessarily trained to do. And so it's been very helpful to be working in the team that I'm working in that's doing the digital rendering um, because the woman who does the digital rendering is also trained as an architect. And so she's able to do these marvelous transformations with the records we have. And my primary research um, assistant has is in our PhD program in architectural history. 
And so I can also rely on some of her eyes and, and her expertise there. Um, so I think just the, the, sh the, the challenge is in, in trying to go back to the 18th century and get all the different archival pieces. I was in France this summer doing archival work to bring up some of those pieces. Um, while also, it's a lot of moving parts. The other thing that has been very challenging is the hotel. As you might imagine, this is not something that they're going to be super excited about, right? Um, and so I have just been developing it the best I can. I have a couple of leads on who to talk to, but I am just wanting to have you know, the best possible kind of storytelling to go with it to give them a chance to say if they would like their voice to be part of the project. Um, it is my hope that they will want to have a voice in the project, you know, as interviewees, but I don't know if that's going to be a possibility. Um, the other two sites have been extremely receptive, and I've been working with the directors of both sites. I'm on the board of one of them, and then the other, I'm a scholar in residence. Um, for them, the African American Museum, has not had many resources to gather the historical documents that tell the story of that site. And so when I find documents, I share it with them. And so that's been very, very helpful. So that also brings up another kind of challenge, which is that depending on um, who's been taking care of those sites, there are economic differences, which are often racialized differences in access to um, the economic resources to do this. So the Herman Grima House has excellent records, excellent, excellent records, going back hundreds of years. But they were founded, um, they are an organization um, started in 1881, consisting of um, very wealthy white women in New Orleans who founded the Women's Exchange. And it was founded specifically to help um, other white women who were not very economically advantaged, who were challenged. And so it was this very wealthy group of white women who founded this women's exchange. And then they bought the Herman Grima House in the 1920s, it was 1925 or 1926. And they initially turned it into a boarding house for um, less advantaged women, again, only white women, and then turned it into a historic site in the 1970s. They have an endowment. Um, and so it is still consists largely of very wealthy white women. In fact, the first it's an all-women board. Um, the first black women on it were myself and another woman who joined three years ago. Um, so since 1881, um, it has been all wealthy white women until 2020. Um, and so they've had all of the economic resources to preserve this house, to take care of all the records, to get the records safekeeping and archives. And so when I come to do the work, it's all there. You know, I just go to the various archives and pull the records that African American Museum, not at all. Um, so there hasn't been a caretaker. This is on a, a land that was formerly owned by um, Simon Mayer, who used to be the city jailer for New Orleans. He built a large villa there and a slave quarters. Um, and the African American Museum now has that land together with the land that was built by um, a, a white planner and builder who sold a lot to free people of color. And so there's a very deep and rich history there, not only of enslavement and freedom, but also of free people of color that I'm probing very, very deeply. Um, but they do not have, there was no similar kind of group. The records are scattered. You're digging through, you know, line by line, the archives just to try to find a few bits and pieces here and there to get together. Um, archaeological reports that have been done on that area. The current director didn't know about some of them, so I would send them to her. So it's just this whole effort of trying to piece it together because the resources and the organization had not been there in the past. Obviously in 1881, um, even though New Orleans has a very, had a very flourishing um, free people of color and then um, group of people of African descent who were flourishing and educated and well off, um, that kind of caretaking that happened with the Herman Grima House has not happened with many of the sites um, that are rich in African American history. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Morgan, thank you so much. Um, just, again, for this presentation, I think we're all just very grateful. I, um, I'm so glad you mentioned the ways in which you know, the, the need to interrogate the, the histories of these places and the dark histories of them, but then also the, the challenges 
Patel, for example, right? I mean, I, I, I think the interrogating that history is very important, but I can understand from the owners is that is that going to decrease actual visit, visitors mm -hmm. to want to stay? Mm -hmm. In addition, when we look at the dark legacies of universities and colleges, think about the moral imagination, the creative imagination here. Are, are there ways we can think about that might that might incentivize universities or colleges to actually be able to interrogate their histories and what that might look like, knowing that mm -hmm. so often enrollment is such a factor. I'm not wanting to incentivize that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good and very difficult question. Um, I think the question of incentives is a good one, and frankly, it's very difficult for me to think of what that incentive would be. It just, I don't know. Um, because universities want to build and expand, um, and their incentive is to build and expand, it's much more difficult for me to see what incentive there would be to perhaps pause and seriously listen to the community before engaging in that expansion. It's, 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 it, it just really is difficult. I, I don't know, frankly. Um, and so what I tend to focus on is first steps of at least knowing and uncovering the history and bringing it forward for conversation, and then trying to bring it to the table when we're moving forward. Um, what I would say that I do think universities could do at the very least is to help to develop the kinds of tools that make it easy for people to dig into the history of a site. So for instance, um, one of the resources that New Orleans has is the Historic New Orleans Collection. And for every lot, every site in the French Quarter, they have exhaustively researched every single lot. You can type in an address for anywhere in the French Quarter, and it will pull up all of the records going back to the 18th century for that lot. It gives you the, cha the full chain of title going back to the 18th century. And it also gives you, if this place was mentioned in a newspaper or a magazine article, they also have that online. And so it's this enormously powerful database where you can know the history of a place and kind of flesh out that history by just typing in the address. Um, I could imagine something where universities pool their resources to create something like that in their own communities, where they are working um, interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way with historians, architectural historians, anthropologists, sociologists, to pool the resources so that you can at least see what the history was. And you could also bring together oral histories of those places. There is, for instance, um, in um, Charlottesville, uh, a place called Vinegar Hill that was a historic black community which has now been destroyed and paved over and is now a Staples and a McDonald's and, and so on, right? Um, I was doing this presentation and someone was telling me they're from Egypt and there's a, a place in Cairo that is incredibly important historically, but it's looking like there's nothing they can do to preserve it. The place is just gonna be raised and something new is going to be built. So what I would say in those instances, if you're just not gonna be in, do, able to do anything about it, um, Eminent domain is what did in the area at Christopher Newport University. And of course, there are always politics around. It's not like eminent domain just has to happen. There are politics around that decision. But if it's a foregone conclusion, at the very least, what you could do is to gather the oral histories, um, you know, any kinds of documents that make it possible to um, do the kind of layered remembering that I'm doing here. Um, so when I think, for instance, the visualizations that I have, um, taking the, the proper kinds of photographs and measurements that if you wanted to be able to show what that history was over time, you would have everything you needed to do that, and you'd have oral histories of people in that area. So at the very least, the history and the cultural richness is not completely missing, although that's, you know, that's a sad substitute for allowing the community to flourish, but it's better than completely losing it and having no memory whatsoever. So it's, it's not really an answer, but it's, it's something. And, and universities, um, have, are, we are repositories of expertise at the very least. That's something we could do. Thank you so much. Darren Davis has told me that that was our last question. Um, so I'm not gonna ask my questions about meaning of lament and praying the Psalms or about what it means to be local or not local for you know, um, Texo Canadian Irishmen. So we'll stop there <laughs> and um, please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.